Gibson's done it again. Expensive collector guitars. Let's talk about these and make some sense out of them. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. All right, let's make sense out of the Leo Scala Super 58 Flying Vs that were released this week. I know I personally had a lot of questions that the website didn't quite answer, so I called into the Gibson Garage to get everything straightened out. So first off, who is Leo Scala? No, he's not a signature artist this time. This is a guitar builder and a craftsman who makes reportedly really great guitars, and he likes to blend motorcycle culture within his creations. So think private luthier builder rather than signature artist guitar. And that's why Gibson is now calling this the Master Artisan Collection. So before we get too far into these flying Vs, let's learn a little bit more about Scala guitars. His website currently not up and running, it's under maintenance, but you can find his Facebook page where we can take a look at some of his previous work. Here's an Ace of Spades inspired Les Paul guitar with a crazy flame maple top hidden under there. That's insane, he covered that over. Here's an interesting Telecaster style build, two bridge pickups on that thing, but you're going to see a lot of running themes with his instruments. We've got skulls, we've got custom made metal parts and pick guards, and they're generally reliced. But he can also do other things, I'm actually quite fond of these designs. So single cut, but almost a little bit of steampunk elements brought into here. Now not completely steampunked, they're not exactly the same thing, but I love this dark ambered over finish with the maple tops, that works really well on the telly as well as this. In fact, I would probably say the telly looks better, I like that really small pick guard he's got going on here. And here you can check out a few of his other works. So now that we have a base understanding of what Leo likes to do on his instruments, let's check out these flying Vs to make sense out of them. They had Leo create 10 of these things in four different series. You have the Classic series, the Hybrid series, the Triple Seven, and then you have the Seraph here, which isn't really a collection, it was just a one-off super art guitar. So the mainline series, the Classic Hybrid and Triple Sevens, three of these were created with different finish options, we could call them. There's a black version with the black pickguard, a white version, white pickguard, and then the custom one, what he's known for, the worn metal engraved pickguard, skull knobs, output jacks, and all that. So you have that on the Classic, as well as on the Hybrid series here, black, white, and custom. Then we've got the Triple Sevens in black, white, and custom. All right, so I think you guys get the idea here. So besides pricing, my first question was, who actually built these guitars? Was it Leo Scala or was it Gibson? Because these are actually Gibson branded. Being part of a new Master Artisan collection, are these just like subletted out Gibson guitars that they didn't actually build and they're just selling them for crazy money? Because that's something that Gibson actually does. When new ownership took over, they kind of overhauled this company and they started to get after some companies that were using their shapes and tried to win in law. Some things were successful, some things weren't. But a lot of the guitar community was like, hey, that's not cool. So what Gibson started to do is they would license out the right to use their body shapes. So you get guys like Banker Guitars that have bought the right to use these shapes and they make their own. For example, I know Chicago Music Exchange blows through these things quite often and they look quite good. He'll build you just about anything, but he's known as the first boutique guitar builder to partner with Gibson. And a fun thing about his name is Banker Guitars. I just always thought maybe that was his last name, but no, he was an ex-banker, so <laughs> Banker Guitars. But look at this, a flying V with a Brazilian rosewood fretboard, only $5,000. That might seem strange to say only 5,000, but do you know how much that would be from Gibson? Well, if you've been watching the show, you've already seen one of these things get documented. It was $20,000 brand new, super limited edition to 81, but you could get it here for 5,000. Officially licensed, but what I always question about these is would they be branded Gibson? And the answer to that is no. So once I saw these things come out, I was like, okay, so they're just gonna license them the shape, not the brand name. That makes a whole lot more sense. Gibson is still making the Gibsons. So to remind you why we went down that rabbit hole is Gibson actually made these guitars. They sent Leo Scala 10 Carina Flying Vs with Brazilian rosewood fretboards. So I think that puts you into a frame of mind of how much these things are going to be. So as far as I understand it, Leo did not build these guitars, but he did everything else on them. He just got husks of guitars. It's a little bit unclear to me who did the finish work at this time, whether they came from Gibson all nice and fresh and then he aged them, or if he applied the finish and did his own thing. Because if you really look up close to these, they almost look like satin finishes. But now before we dive into each of these three series, let's go ahead and answer the question everybody has. How expensive were these things brand new? Because Gibson has learned that when you have a really expensive guitar, it's better just to say, 
called the Gibson Garage. Anybody who's actually interested will buy these and they know they're expensive. They don't post a public price to the website because it just encourages trolls. But people talk on the internet. So these things range from about 35,000 up to 60,000. And as of the time of recording this episode, they only have three of these left. A hybrid and two triple sevens. That means yes, the really expensive Seraph has sold. So let's get into the classic series. Reportedly, these were about $35,000 brand new if you just got a regular pick guard variation. So this was just a regular flying V with the Brazilian rosewood fretboard, Carina bodies, all that good stuff with a light aging job. What makes all of the Scala guitars interesting is the fact that he made everything on this. So if you look at the pickup, he actually has a dog-eared P90 right here. Well, at least that's what he wants you to think because that's actually on the side of the humbucker ring right here. So they're just one pickup flying V's, which makes them kind of interesting. But besides all the custom parts he put on it, I mean, they were built very standard to spec. For somebody who wanted a cool limited edition Gibson, this was the one for them. Pretty much the only difference between black and white really comes down to the types of aging on it and the color of the pickguard. However, from the way that I understand it, the ones that got these metal pickguards ran about $5,000 more expensive than the other ones. Obviously, because it takes more time to do stuff like that. But you'll notice the rubber bumper strip on this one's actually replaced with metal that says Gibson. I don't know how I feel about that one to be honest because that rubber strip is there for a reason. It's so you can sit and play it like normal without the guitar sliding off your lap. Now most people just straddle it classical style so it's not really that big of a deal. It's meant to be more of a functional piece of art. But that was something that made me go, huh. <laughs> so the classics were pretty cool but they're already sold out. Now the hybrid series gets interesting. So we already talked about the pickguard designs and things like that, but hybrid, they changed up this right here. I didn't even notice this until I took a look at Gibson's official interview with Mr. Scala. So he has a convertible tailpiece on this thing. That is actually a raised portion right here. It's like a normal stop bar tailpiece. So it's still technically a string through flying V. It's just a little bit different. Whereas the other ones just had your typical ferrules, this one has a big block of metal in it. So you can run it through there and come out the flying V just like normal, or you take this raised section and you top load it. You know, like sometimes Telecasters, you'll have the option of a top loading or a string through version, and some of them get both. This is basically his take on that. And he did it so elegantly that from the stock photos, I didn't even realize something was amiss here. But to kind of illustrate this in the stock photos, they strung them up from the factory all differently. So this one, it's all top loaded, his custom. The black one, they did half and half. You've got three of them string through, three of them top loaded. And lastly, white, they did all string through. As of the time I'm recording this, the custom hybrid is still available at 55,000 and the black one is available at 45,000. So quite a premium on those ones for all the metal working that he did. And then lastly, we've got the 777. Okay, my first question was, where on earth does the 777 name come from? And you can actually get that from Gibson's video. So Lonnie Mack, he's well known for using a flying V that has a weird Bigsby on it. He's the first guy to do this whole weird thing, and I love it. It just, it's such an iconic aesthetic. But Lonnie's original flying V was rumored to be the seventh one made. The Bigsby unit that's on here is called the Bigsby B7. You typically find them on a Les Paul, not a Flying V. And when Leo was making these, he made the three classics. He made the three hybrids, and then he was starting on this. So the first one of the series that he had to create some name for just happened to be the seventh, so it was lucky number sevens right there. So yeah, you basically just have some more metal engravings going on, and you get the Lonnie Mac B7 Bigsby vibes on here. Which is kind of a shame that you don't have the string through tailpiece. I really do like the hybrids the most, but it seems people buying at this caliber of instrument, they like the hybrids the least despite being probably the more unique option. Everything else is pretty much the same. But you have to remember, Leo actually hand wound all of these pickups himself. He made everything. I'm not sure about the white and black pick guards. Maybe Gibson gave those to him. But what I would really be curious about is to tear one of these things apart to see, does it actually have the neck pickup route? Or did Gibson make these specially just for his one pickup design? Or did they send these to him? And then he was like, you know what? Let's just do one pickup. I'm actually kind of surprised that he didn't like try to vary it up. Like the classic series just gets your regular two humbuckers. The hybrid series that's when they introduced this maybe the 777 they could have went crazy and just did like a true p90 or heck put an alnico 5 staple pickup in it but they left that all the same so that leaves us one last one to talk about the serif okay brace yourself guys this one was sixty thousand dollars and it took less than two days to sell i'm impressed gibson i'm impressed <laughs> 
The collector guitar world is a very fascinating one, and if you're not finally in tune with it, these numbers probably sound like absolute madness. I mean, we're talking brand new cars here. But again, I ask you to base it off of a model that's already long gone sold out from last year, the collector's edition Flying Vs and Explorers when they first brought the Karina back in 2021. So these guys were 20,000 brand new. They've been selling used between about 22 to 28. If anybody's interested in mine, I'll cut you a deal because I'm ready to move on to other high-end guitars here. But really look to the Explorers. They only made 19 of those. So you could compare these Flying Vs to kind of like that. And those were $30,000 brand new. And I was able to sell mine for 70,000 because the demand was so crazy. So putting that into perspective, to have this unique piece that we're about to look at be 60000 I guess it makes sense. Well, only in the collector's market anyways. So let's take a look here. It's kind of based on the 777, except for they did some additional stuff here. So he's got a normal pick guard on right here, but then he has an extender right here like one of the original Flying Vs had. And once again, you've got some motorcycle vibes going on here. So you got a Pontiac right here. It's got the Bigsby. It's all aged, looking good. And then he has a Schaller roller bridge on this on top of it. And the Seraph here actually gets like real jewels in the knob. So that's kind of cool. But something cool about the Bigsby on the Seraph, I'm not sure if that was that way on the 777s or not, is that it's actually 360. Most Bigsby's, they have a stopping point, but this one, you can just keep twirling it around. It's a little bit more user-friendly. And then on the side, the true name of these, the Super 58s, he's got a custom plate. Now this one might actually kind of work as a bumper because these are raised, but obviously you've got all the aging to appreciate on this. And then he's got this graphic on the back. Now the first time I saw this, I was like, meh. I don't really like it, I'm sorry. But then the second time I looked at it, and I knew a little bit more about Leo and his work, I was able to appreciate it more. He purposefully used this one because the Karina was a little bit darker. And even he agrees that graphics don't belong on a 58 style flying V, but it kind of fits the whole aesthetic of this one, so he wanted to make it look like it had been there for a long time. So it's basically a piece of functional art. And then take a look at these cases. Those are really cool and custom. Apparently he did those up himself. So Gibson just sent Leo the regular Flying V style cases and he had to strip them down, redo them to look like all these customs. So it's an expensive collector's guitar. So before we get into my personal thoughts and opinions, if you're interested in learning about that, a quick recap. We've got a brand new collection called the Master Artisan Collection. We've got the Classic Series, the Hybrid Series, and the 777 Series that have white, black, and custom metal engraved pick cards and then one ultra high-end art version of the 777. Okay, so let's real talk here. How many collections does Gibson need? It's starting to get a little bit confusing. We've got the modern collection, the mod collection, like modified, original collection, this new master artisan collection, the archive collection, the exclusives collection. Now, to a lesser extent, we also have the generation collection of acoustics, the artist collection, the slash collection, because he's such a big artist, he deserves his own, the custom shop collection, and then the Murphy Labs collection. <laughs> There's just so many collections. That's enough collections. If I wasn't learning this stuff as it goes on, it definitely would get confusing, but they're just trying to make sense of it on their website, so it makes sense. But this implies that they are going to be doing more small runs with other custom luthiers. And I saw a comment on the Gibson video here that it says, it's really cool that you're not trying to tie down independent luthiers, but you're still giving them access to the Gibson's name, brand, and trademarks. A lot of people, they probably hadn't heard of Leo Scala before until Gibson brought these collections to the limelight. So maybe now more people will want to order direct from him. Like if you think about it, Fender, they find all these guys, they scoop them up because they know they're good, like Ron Thorne or any of the other master builders, and they employ them. They say, yeah, come build our guitars. This one, Gibson is just testing the waters with them. Like maybe they will eventually hire one of these, but most of these guys, they probably just do better working on their own once they have an established clientele like Scala does. So they're just kind of borrowing their works, which is interesting because it puts their mark in an established brand. So guys that are brand snobs like me, we can get a taste of their work. As far as the pricing goes on all these, I think I've already made my thoughts pretty clear on that. They're very expensive, but in the collector's market, it makes sense. However, I'm not sure if I quite wanted to invest in one of these like if I was gonna get one I think the hybrid thing is pretty cool but I probably would have went for the Seraph for the review and documentations because that's a one of one it's a really interesting design it was worthy of documenting but yeah I, I didn't have 60k burning a hole in my pocket this time and I got beat to the punch anyways the aesthetic choices of some of these they, they weren't my favorite either and perhaps the biggest thing that made me really not like the Seraph was this 
So the other one's got the normal plastic Gibson badge put on it, but this one he went a little bit above and beyond and did a metal one. But this makes it look so fake. Like, the metal thing is cool, right? But it shouldn't be flat. I wish there would have been a way that he could have, like, molded it to the same, like, three dimensions that the original ones have. I think then that would have been an awesome touch. But maybe it's just this photo that makes it look weird. I'm sure on stage you really can't tell. But that was just one thing that kind of turned me off about that one. So now I turn the floor to you guys. Do you like these at all? I'm just saying, do you like them? I'm not asking, would you pay... 30 to $60,000 for any of these. And if you had to choose one, which one was your favorite? I think if I put collectability aside, I probably would have preferred the hybrid at the very end of the day. What builder would you like to see Gibson partner with next? Oh man, <laughs> I would love to see Gibson work with Ron Thorne because it would be the Fender signature Gibson. <laughs> I know he built some guitars on the side for himself, so I don't know if he'd be contractually bound down to only building things for Fender or if he could work for both, but that would be funny. But I think it's great that Gibson is getting into the game of putting the name of the customizer with the title of the guitar. So with that, Troglodytes, I will leave you today. I hope you enjoyed learning about these. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.